But we'll do it the old we'll do old school for today. Open your Bibles, please. Romans chapter number three. Romans chapter number three, and I will begin reading with verse number nine. During the course of this message today, I will not be politically correct. Just so you know that up front. There was an occasion when John MacArthur spoke from the fifth chapter of, of First Peter concerning the relationship of a husband and wife, and he had uh, several people get up and leave. But let me remind you that the Bible is plain on the position of the husband and the wife. The Bible is plain on the position that a husband is to be the head of his home and the wife is there to assist him. She was made to be a help meet for him. So I'm going to be stepping into some territory today that would not be acceptable in some circles. But I agree with Paul when he said here in the third chapter, let, uh, in verse number four, God forbid, yea, let God be true and every man a liar. So I will go with God's side. What do you think? The reason our world is in such a predicament is because people have forsaken the direction that God gave. Starting with verse number 9 of Romans chapter 3, our subject today is bad news, good news 2.0. Verse number 9. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. We are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the blessings of the day and our privilege to gather and lift up the name of Jesus. We ask now that you will guide in this service that all that is said and done might uplift your name and praise to the one worthy. And we ask, Lord, that our hearts will be open and our minds attentive. Lord, we have so many prayer requests, but we ask for your will in every case. And we ask, Lord, for your peace and your comfort of your spirit. Guide us now and forgive me where I fail. For Christ's sake I pray. Amen. Bad news, good news, 2.0. There is a three-letter word that has plagued man his entire life. And that word is sin. What is sin? 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 4, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now that word, the law, that definite article, it's not a law, it is the law, and we understand that to be, that to be God's law. Man has made laws to protect themselves, as it is written in Romans chapter 9, that they are there not for the good, but they are there for the evil. We depend on them for our protection. We depend on them to arrest the lawbreakers 
and confine them so that society will be safe. Lord, help us to understand that the lawbreakers are coming younger and younger and younger. Can I... I'm of the belief that these video games, these violent video games, has affected our society and our young people. I remember a time when, the, when some people came out and said that Bugs Bunny was too violent. And when you get Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd and, and Donald Duck together, and when Elmer Fudd turns with that shotgun and blows Donald Duck's beak off and walks over and looks at Bugs Bunny and said, you're despicable. They start saying, that's too violent. But have you heard anyone stand up and say, these video games where people are being shot in these war games, that's not violent? And it corrupting the minds of people? I think so. But we depend on police to keep us safe. That is their place. Most of them have on their cars to protect and serve. I spilled some gas one time in the gas station downtown and a couple officers were inside and I said, may I ask you to help me push my car out away from the pump because I've spilled some gas there. And of course they were very obliging. They helped me get away from there, get it out of there, so they come out and do whatever they need to do. But they're there to protect and serve. God's law was given to the children of Israel for the express purpose of establishing a governmental, a religious, and a social order for them to live by. That 619 different laws that God gave them was the list of do's and of don'ts. And if you want a summary of all that, then you turn to the Ten Commandments. Let's turn to Genesis, the book of beginnings. And I go to chapter 2 of the book of Genesis. Verses 8 and 9, we have God planting a, a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. Those verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst or the middle of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know, this would be a vegetarian's paradise. All the fruits and greenery. I told you about the girls bringing me some green thing in a glass and say, Daddy, this is wonderful. And I know, thank you, it's green. I don't. But they had a vegetarian's paradise. Okay? But you notice in verse number 8 that the man was placed there. Go down with me to verse number 16. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree in the garden thou mayest eat freely, or freely eat, excuse me, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not Eat, eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Who was that given to? It was given to the man, wasn't it? Okay? Now, you, 
Let's, let's pause a minute to look. Thou shalt surely. That word shalt is that strong affirmative that we've talked about before. It's not may, can, could, possibly. It is shalt. Absolutely, positively. If you eat of that tree, you will die. Did Adam know that the Lord was talking about spiritual death rather than physical death? It is later... But the Lord tells Adam, it's not good for you to be alone. I will make a help meet for you. And she will be with you. She will work with you. She will live with you. And then, Adam is called upon to name the animals. You know, science today would tell you how in the world... Could Adam name all the animals? Well, there wasn't quite as many then as there are now. Just like the ark, there's not quite as many animals then as there are now. And into this scene, he takes from his rib and makes the woman. She was not taken from his head to be over him. She was not taken from his feet to be walked upon. She was taken from his rib to be close to his heart. Amen? Amen. Just be thankful that the Lord sent someone that's, fit, that's willing to live with you, brethren. Some of us are not easy to live with. <laughs> But now in chapter 3, we see a serpent that comes and lies are told. Who is he speaking to? Or to whom is he speaking? He's speaking to the woman, isn't he? Aren't you allowed to eat of all the fruits of the trees? No. God said we can't have that. Did he really say that if you eat, you will die? I know. He doesn't want you to eat of that tree because you'll be as smart as him. That sounds like man today, isn't it? Trying to be as smart as God. Okay. So she eats it. Verse number 6. Genesis 3, verse number 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was... Good for food, pleasant, it, uh, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, standing next to her, and these four words is where we start. And he did eat. And their eyes were opened, were both open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed thick leaves together and made themselves apron. And they started hiding. As we say, you know, I'm not advocating nudity, but you know, clothing is a sign of sin, isn't it? We are covering ourselves. But, As usual, God comes and says, Adam, where are you? You think the Lord lost him? Where are you? Lord, it's this woman you gave me. It's her fault. Then the woman says, Oh, don't look at me. It's that serpent. It's its fault that all this has happened. But the responsibility of breaking God's law fell on whom? It fell on Adam, didn't it? Wherefore, Romans 5.12, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Turn with me to Nehemiah Chapter 9. Nehemiah 
chapter number 9. And I'm going to read verse number 6. And I would encourage you to mark this in your Bible. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven and the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the sea and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. In the creative work, God was alone, and then He made the heavens, and then He made the host of heaven. Among the host of heaven do we not have the angels? Amen. We had Gabriel, Michael, the prince of God, and we had Lucifer, the shining one. Now we go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter number 28. Starting with verse number 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, and the beryl, and the onyx, and the jasper, and the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets, and all thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Does anyone know of a verse of Scripture or a principle anywhere in the Bible that the devil suddenly became this ugly thing with horns, a pitchfork, and tail? There's nothing in there. No indication that he changed his appearance whatsoever. Why does the devil make things so appealing? Because he looks so appealing. Continue reading. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in the, day, in the ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. You need to mark that till iniquity was found in thee by the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled in the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned who was the first sinner it would be Lucifer wouldn't it okay therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain a mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the, of the stones of fire. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Verse 17. Need to mark verse 17. Okay. What was the issue? One, his beauty, the way he looked. Two, pride. Pride. In Luke chapter number 10 and verse 16, I saw Satan fall from heaven as lightning from the sky. Let's remember something. Doesn't matter how big he is, how beautiful he is, or how much pride he has, he will never outdo God. Amen. Never. But because of this, he was cast out. And the next time we see him, he is involved in this serpent 
to beguile Eve and to and Adam, Adam and Eve and cause them to sin. That's where sin originated. You know, there's a high price for sin. Wasn't Adam and Eve driven from the garden? Why were they driven from the garden? Because there was a tree of life in there. And they had no spiritual life to take it. Okay? Again, what is sin? Sin is the breaking of God's law. That is what Satan encouraged Adam and Eve to do. The dictionary reads, any want of conformity unto transgression of transgression of the law of God. If we break God's law, we have sinned. Okay? That make, is that reasonable? Turn with me to Isaiah chapter number fifty-nine. Isaiah chapter number 59. Verses 1 and 2. Again, I would encourage you to mark these. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities, that word iniquities means sin, doesn't it? Willful sin. have separated between you and your God and your sins has hid his face from you that he will not hear. So, do we understand that sin breaks, for a child of God, sin breaks fellowship with God. And once that fellowship is broken, only confession of that sin will restore it. I appreciate these brethren and their testimonies. Our speaker Friday night also had a wonderful testimony of how the word was preached, how the Spirit of God convicted his heart and brought him to the place of asking forgiveness. I'm of the belief that the Lord will save anybody, anywhere, anytime if they meet the criteria for salvation. That is, the hearing of the word, the acknowledgement of the sin, the brokenness of the heart, and the asking for forgiveness. I realize a lot of this is all bad news. <laughs> but we'll get to the good news eventually. Let's go back to Romans chapter 3. In this modern city of Rome, they certainly had their fair share of things going on that you would find in any modern city today. You see, God placed within every man that understanding of a need of worship. Every culture has had some sort of religion that they developed or that was handed down to them that they would worship. Sometimes it would be idols. That was the more common. There was a tribe in Latin America that had never seen man and they saw a plane go over top of them and they thought that they were about to be visited by God. So they built an altar with a plane on it. I don't know if any of you have read The Tip of the Spear by Elliot. That they landed that plane, started handing out food, and they came out and they were afraid of them, and they killed three of the men. But yet the family would go back and be there for the next 30 years sharing the gospel and living with them. 
And I know that was not easy, do you think? That was not easy. But they vowed to share the gospel, and they did. So every culture has had some sort of religion. Most required human sacrifice. That was the common method of atonement. When God began dealing with man, you notice that he required a lamb to be sacrificed without spot or blemish. That substitute, that shedding of blood of an innocent. I've told people before, thank the Lord I live in the New Testament era because if I had to pull out a knife and raise a lamb's neck to slit its throat, they would disown me. But they had a ceremonial knife. And even when Abraham was told to take your only son to a mountain, I will show you and offer him unto me. He had, the, he had a particular wood, he had a, a particular knife and the fire to build this thing. And on that Mount Moriah, later David would buy that threshing floor and later they would build the temple, Solomon would build the temple on Mount Moriah. And when you go there today, you go into the temple area, they have the place where they pray. You go inside and turn and it's not very far that you come up against this rock, this huge rock. And on top of there is where the Palestinians believe that Abraham offered Ishmael. We know he offered Isaac. And it is a huge, huge rock. But sacrifice and atonement... But in any major city in the Bible days, you would find idols and idol worship. Turn back with me to chapter 1 of the book of Romans. And I begin reading with verse number 20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, changing the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and birds four-footed beasts and creeping things. Is that exactly what happened? And now we say, well, we are an enlightened people. This is the 20, 20th, 21st, 22nd, 21st century. <laughs> and we're a lot smarter than what they were then. But you know what? We're a lot smarter in that we hide our idols. We don't put great big huge images out in our front yard. Being good Baptist, we don't have the statue of Mary buried in our front yard and turned a certain way to be sure our house sells quickly. We have our idols hid. They're private, and we privately worship them. Anything that we put before God is an idol, isn't it? Where did idol worship come from? Does it not come from the depravity of man? Where did human sacrifice come from? It was the depravity of man, man trying to do his own thing to appease their God. Isaiah, and Isaiah 44 would stand and tell them, why are you worshiping the thing that you have cut out of wood you pick up the shavings, you bring that into the house and throw it into your fire so you can cook your food and then you go out and you worship this thing that cannot speak, cannot hear, and cannot move. And we say, oh, that's terrible. Oh, yes. Shall we step off the curb here and tell you that there are things that we also worship that cannot move, cannot speak, cannot do anything, but we still, they take up our time, they, uh, we immerse ourselves in them, and sometimes we put them above God. 
Lord help us to understand that whenever something is mightier than God, it is an idol. Okay, back to chapter 3 one more time. And I look down, starting with verse number 19. How do we know something is wrong? It's wrong because we have the law that states it's wrong. 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Did that was that not exactly the reason for the law of Moses? It was to prove that they were sinners and they could not atone for themselves. Verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. We want you to bring a lamb without spot or blemish. We want you to put that lamb up for 17 days so it can be observed to be sure that it is perfect is the word that we would use. And then when you bring it out, you bring it to the priest who will examine it and certify that this animal is worthy of sacrifice. And then they take it inside and there they have these altars all around where men have brought their animals and that priest would take that animal and raise the knife and slit its throat, catch its blood, and then the priest would take that inside to the high priest who would then take that into the most holy place and offer it for the sins of himself and for Israel. Is that right? And when he come out that second time, he would lift his hands and he would say, Peace be unto you. Loud enough for all the people can hear it. And they knew that their sin had been forgiven. He would turn to a goat, put his hands on the head of this goat, and he would confess the sins of all Israel. And a strong man would scoop up that goat and take it out in the wilderness and never be seen again. Isn't there a verse of scripture that talks about he sends our sins as far as the east is from the west and remembers them no more? <laughs> All right. Now that's what God required. Israel had corrupted the whole element of sacrifice. They had allowed the, the Gentile portion of the temple to have vendors all set up, money being exchanged, animals being bought, things going on, and Jesus walked in and, and I guess the word is that he went berserk. Right? Throwing over the money changers Running, letting loose the animals. This is a house of prayer. You have made it a den of thieves. But when it came time, Jesus would offer himself. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. Oh, excuse me, that's 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. We've heard enough bad news. Let's hear some good news. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 21. For he hath made him, for he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Okay? He did not need to offer, offer sacrifice for himself or he had no sin. But he offered himself for us that we might be the beneficents of righteousness because of him. you understand that your spirit, your soul, that the Lord saved, has no sin. Is that right? 1 John 3 and verse 9. But then you read the first chapter 
If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us, that means your flesh is still sinful. Okay? And my, my, aren't we protective of our sin? <laughs> aren't we protective of our sin? But the point is this. The bad news, we are sinners. We shall forever be sinners as long as we live in these bodies. When we were saved, the Lord gave us, Ephesians chapter 1, the earnest of our salvation, the down payment, which was the saving of our souls. You are a safe, if you've asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, you are a safe person today, you will be a safe person tomorrow, and you will always be a safe person. You will always be a child of God, and when He breaks the eastern sky, your name will be called, and you will be called up to meet Him in the air. Amen. Okay? That is a dumb deal. There's no question of that. I don't walk around wondering, Lord, help me be good enough. Isn't that pitiful? Help me be good enough to watch what I do, watch what I say, watch where I go, because I don't want to do something that will break my, that will cause God for me, or cause me to lose my salvation. That's not the way to live. Because when the Lord saves a person, He gives them everlasting life. Eternal life. And He could be the sorriest child of God that there ever has been, ever will be. But He's still a child of God. And when the sky breaks loose and Jesus comes, He will look down and say, You! Come here. Thank the Lord He's going to wipe away all tears or we never would stop crying of all that we'd have to see besides the tears of loved ones who are not saved. Let's talk about those tears of joy that we will have when we see our loved ones again. But chapter 22 of the book of Revelation, He'll wipe away all tears from their eyes. It's a good thing. So He is the reason you and I are going to heaven. He did nothing for Himself. He did everything for us. What was the purpose of Him suffering and going through such terrible treatment and people spitting at Him and throwing things at Him and I mean treating Him so bad that a couple of disciples said, Lord, you want us to call fire down from heaven on these heathen? and wipe them out you don't know what spirit you're of and later they would be called the sons of thunder wouldn't they oh but one day praise God one day he's not going to come back as the mild meek and lowly lamb he's going to come back as the king of kings and lord of lords and he will walk as such and he people will turn and they will bow before him and acknowledge Him that He is the Son of God and the rightful King of Israel. And when saved people walk before Him, He's going to say, what have you done? Remember that section of Scripture, 2 Corinthians 5.10? Those things done in the body, whether they be good or bad? What you do with your life? Did you give it to me? Okay? I don't care who the preacher is. When that time came that he was called to preach, one, he was scared out of his mind, and two, he started rationalizing every way possible to get out of it. To get away from it. When I went to my pastor, how do you know that you're called to preach? <laughs> he said, stay out of it if you can. <laughs> That's what he told me. Stay out of it if you can. Well, obviously I couldn't. Okay? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I have my faults. I, too, am a sinner. I don't care if you put a white robe on somebody. They're still a sinner. Amen? Amen. <laughs> 
sin is the problem, Christ is the answer. Okay? He doesn't look on us and say, oh, this person's too bad. They have done too much. They have committed crimes so horrible. They don't deserve. Well, to be honest with you, no one deserves heaven. None of us could ever work to obtain heaven. But yet he reaches down and says, I will forgive you right where you are. Okay? I will grant you peace. I will put my presence into your soul. And I will open that heart of yours to hear things that will touch you so deeply. I've heard songs that I had to pull over to the side of the road because it touched my heart so deeply. I've heard words of preachers and I would, you know, sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm listening to my morning sermon <laughs> and uh, he'll say something and I'll go, hey, that's great. And I'll start writing it down. <laughs> oh my. I know that all of us have heard somebody that has touched our hearts so deeply that we feel the Lord's presence. You don't need a series of meetings to have revival. We can have revival anytime we want it. When our hearts are opened and we invite Him in. Stand with me please as we have this verse of invitation.